The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tyson, my partner, Malik Hill. And uh, we're already at the end of May, getting close to June. NBA playoffs are almost over. So we're almost at that hiatus period of the sports season. Not much left to go on, so we got a lot of little news and notes, tidbits and things, and we'll get into some of the playoffs. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's just another day. But sports season is winding down, which is wild to me. I, I think next week we could get into a little bit, a little tiny bit of a team that's actually interesting right now. And we thought they were probably going to be terrible. The Detroit Tigers. Uh, yeah. Listen. I don't want to give anybody hope, okay? Listen. Riley Green. I, th- I think we need to say a few words about that man. But we- that can wait. Uh, things are starting to look... And a part of it is the division, positive. but it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was gonna say if you're if you're a baseball fan, your season's still going. If you're a NASCAR fan, your season's still going. If you're a golf fan, season's still going. But for the majority of people, yeah, that are out here, um, sports are winding down. Uh, so now we have some things to talk about that we missed uh, last week. I kind of want to start with what you brought up before we started. We went live. Um, college uh, football schedules got released. And uh, there's an interesting one where MSU is going to be playing. Uh, they're in a night game, right? It's night game? Yeah. Uh, against Penn State at Ford Field. An indoor stadium. On a Friday. On a Friday in yeah. late November. Yeah, late November, November. 24th. Uh, Friday where the Lions play. Shielding themselves from the snow, maybe, perhaps. You're giving away the advantage. So you don't like it. Any bit of it, listen. I don't think I don't think MS, most MSU fans probably aren't on board with this, honestly. There are probably a few out of town that'll be excited to fly in for this. Mm-hmm. Just because like there will the elements won't be a problem. They'll be able to be somewhat warm in a stadium watching their team. Yeah. But besides the fact that MSU might not be that great this season, besides that fact, like I said, was taking the, taking them out of the snow. You could have made it slow. You could have made it tough. You could have made it a physical game. Penn State is favored to be a t- at least a top three team in the East, and they could possibly win the division this year. Mm-hmm. That's how talented they are. They finally have a quarterback that everybody's excited about in Drew Aller. You mean they weren't excited about Sean Clifford? Listen, we're not going to bring up Sean Clifford. We'd, I'm I'm upset that we might have to say his name during NFL games because the Packers drafted him for some reason. Mm-hmm. I I don't I don't understand it, but I I don't see outside of that of it being somewhat of a money maker. That's the only thing I can see with this because I don't see any advantage in terms of mm-hmm. like the actual game. Yeah, I I don't see it. Yeah, the thing I didn't think about, because I don't really care. Like, it sounds kind of cool on paper, play indoors, play yeah. in a big stadium. It'll be cool for the fans, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But the people that are like, like the college kids that would have to like travel. Yeah, that'll be, yeah. That'll like, be annoying. I'm sure they would like to do it, but it's also. They'll still, probably have a few buses maybe, but. Yeah. And, and it's not on like. the weather. Right. It's not like one of those times where it's. Like some big game or something where it's like, oh yeah, let's all go travel down to wherever to go watch go down to ohio to watch the ohio state game or something like that it's not necessarily like that like it's just a weird almost inconvenience for students and people directly in east lansing i guess um but i don't i don't mind it it to me it's kind of cool but at the same time like at michigan state might not be very good this year so what's what's the reasoning for putting them in this big stadium in the big game quote-unquote 
Is this like their only big game of the season? I don't know. I didn't really look at the schedule. I'll be honest. But uh, I, I mean, I, of course, Michigan. But yeah, does Michigan? What games does Michigan have that are big besides? You know, the usual. I mean, the the game at Penn State might be the biggest game in the conference this year because of the hype around Penn State and Michigan being favorite as number one most likely. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, Michigan Ohio State. Yeah. Um, Who's Ohio State's I, quarterback? Have they? Even... They haven't decided yet. Okay. Which puts a smile on my face, but mm-hmm. the offense is still going to be potent for the most part. Okay. They're going to most likely walk through the schedule, but yeah, they're they still haven't decided who their quarterback is going to be. Yeah, because I know there, there's not that many um, big games out of conference from what I saw, so that's that's a little disappointing. Yeah, Michigan playing Texas next year mm-hmm. is going to be the one everybody looks to. Yeah, most likely. Um, oh, speaking speaking of Sean Clifford, I don't know why Sean Clifford made me think of this. Oh, because guys in, that got drafted in the uh, NFL. Did you see? Because you're you're a Jake Hayner guy, right? Absolutely. Did you see his his photo shoot uh, listen, at OTAs? It, he's he's a <laughs> listen. He's a handsome dude, but the the instant photo shoot looks and the yeah, it was it was a bit much. I'm pretty sure some of it was a joke. Listen, he he went Zoolander. He pulled if, out all the all the face. If that was like looks, even ninety percent serious, then yeah, we got a problem. But I, I'm pretty I'm hoping sure. it was half. Jo- I'm hoping it was mostly a joke. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah. Um, but that was funny. I saw that come across the news feed. Um, sticking with the NFL, we got the Lions schedule. We got the whole NFL schedule, but who really cares? We'll look at that stuff more as we get closer. But the Lions schedule came out right off the gate, and we forgot to talk about it last week. Um, Are you excited? I'm real excited, actually. Um, I think it's perfect. So the Lions, after not getting a primetime game last year, at all, um, except for being flexed into the Packers game at the end of the season. The Lions have four primetime games. Unfortunately, three of them are Thursday night games, and one is a Monday night game, which I think could be really fun. Uh, so they have to play, they're playing the Chief, or the they're playing the Packers twice on a Thursday. One is the Thanksgiving game, one is a regular Thursday night game. They're playing the Raiders on Monday night, and that is in late October, I think. Yeah, October 30th. Yeah, okay. Um, And then the big one, they open the NFL season against the Chiefs on Thursday. And I am ecstatic because it does not matter, in my opinion. One, uh, unless... Okay. Well, it, how, the, how how can you be excited if okay. it doesn't matter? So the, that's my question. Because if it doesn't we, matter how how can you be excited? Because we just get we get to play the Chiefs with, in my opinion, no strings attached, and we just get to show what we can do. Now the only problem the the problem is it will matter if we get blown out. I will say that that's my caveat. But so if they win in impressive fashion, that won't matter. If we win, we are the best team in the NFL for. So a it does days. matter. <laughs> Is what you're saying. I guess. <laughs> but I guess my other point is that, like, at the end of the day, if if we lose, it doesn't – it's like a win-win. Like, if we win, we're on top yeah, of the it NFL. Won't, it, won't fully, it won't affect how the rest of the season yes. goes. We're on top of the NFL Hopefully. for a couple days because they'll, they'll play Sunday and, you know, whatever. But we'll have beaten the Chiefs during their Super Bowl ceremony, and we'll be the talk of the town on ESPN on Friday – and going into the weekend and stuff like that, be super exciting. If we lose, but we stay close, okay, we we proved that we can compete with the best of the best because they just won the Super Bowl. No big deal. Now, if we get blown out, it's a little bit disappointing because there's a lot of hype going into this season, um, and that'll deflate the balloon. But as long as we stay competitive, and, I mean, we can lose by 14, and it'd be, you know, a productive game, potentially. Um so it's nice to get a game of that caliber early on because last year the Lions struggled to get out the gate. So if we do it now and we still struggle yeah, against the Chiefs, it's, it doesn't feel as bad, I guess. I don't know. But it, to me, it's really exciting just because they get to open the season. They play, I mean, 
possibly the best team in the NFL again. And uh, it's a big prove it point right away. And then their schedule gets somewhat fairly easy the rest of the way. How do you feel about it? I absolutely love the fact that the NFL is making the Lions play a prove it game week one, even though this won't prove how they finish throughout the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. But since everybody is buying into the hype of the Lions actually making real positive steps, yeah, they want everybody to see it on the <laughs> on the national level. Mm -hmm. Week one, returning champions at home, fans celebrating, team celebrating, everything they accomplished last season and trying to start the season off in a great way. Yeah, I can't wait. Mm -hmm. It's going to be must-see TV. September 7th. Mark that calendar. So after the Chiefs, uh, we could chalk that up as, you know, win or lose. Then we play the Seahawks, and that's at home. We play at home against the Falcons. We go to Green Bay. We come home against the Panthers. We go to Tampa Bay. Go to Baltimore. At, oh, we're at home for the Raiders? I thought that was. Yeah, it's a home game. Oh. So we get Monday night at Ford Field. Okay, that's Hope even Hope you don't better. lose that one. I thought we were going to Allegiant Stadium. Um, then we have to go to SoFi, play the Chargers, back home against the Bears, uh, home against the Packers, go to New Orleans, go to Chicago, home against the Broncos, go to Minnesota, go to Dallas, home to the Vikings to end the season. Where do you see the Lions finishing this season? We'll do this again when we get closer and we know more, but your early on predictions. Yeah. Are early they a prediction. Are they a double-digit win team for you? I think it would be a disappointment if they weren't. Yeah. They they are expected to win at least 10 games. Mm -hmm. They won line nine last year. And if they're not at the top of the division for most of the season, I think it'll be a disappointment also. Yeah. So I think 11-6. and six. I think that's realistic. Okay. With the schedule they have, with the improvements they should make, another year in this system, another year growing in this new culture. I think eleven and six is realistic. Ten and seven wouldn't be a huge disappointment, but the hype is real. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Lions fans, they say they're drinking the blue Kool Aid. Mm-hmm. It's like they almost expect like a 13-4 and four season, which would be insane if they pulled that off. Yeah. Well, although it's not impossible because the Vikings did it last year and they were frauds. Yeah. So Part of me <clears throat> keeps thinking the magic number for me is 12-5. and five. I mean, they could pull it. Do you think they should pull off another like 5-1 and one division record? They should. If they don't, that's my disappointment. Okay. If they don't win the division like handily. I was just about to say, do you think they should win the division handily? I, I think that's the, kind of the problem. Especially now with Minnesota maybe having running back issues. Uh, yeah, Justin Jefferson's really good and all that. But um, the Lions defense, I would assume, is going to be much improved. So I feel like they should be able to, to beat the Vikings again. I don't see the Bears getting so much better, even though people keep saying that Justin Fields is way better this season, blah, blah, blah. And then the Packers. I, I think the Packers will be better than people think. But I don't think that's going to be very good yeah. necessarily. It, it all depends on what Jordan Love gives them. And yeah. Nobody knows what's, what it's going to be. And I, I don't think the Packers' defense is what it was at one point either. So I, I think the Lions should run away with the division, and that's definitely how they get it done. So then I look at their other losses. Chiefs, okay, we'll take that one as a loss. Ravens, I'll take it as a loss. Chargers, Chargers I'll take that as a loss. Jags week two won't be easy. That's preseason. Oh, that's preseason. My bad. Yeah, the first three are Seahawks preseason. week two won't be easy. No, it won't, but it will be at home, so I'm hoping that there's yeah. some some help there. Um, and then maybe split against the Vikings and maybe lose to the Cowboys. Yeah. Falcons, Packers, Panthers, Buccaneers. You hope that's four straight wins. Yeah. You the Falcons so. are slowly getting some hype, though. So I, they are? Yeah. But you, you don't know what Arthur Smith is doing with all those weapons. Right. Last year, the Kyle Pitt situation was just weird. Mm -hmm. you, you don't know what they're going to look like. Yeah. For the Falcons, I hope our run defense is much improved. Yeah. 
That's the only thing. The Baker Bucks, you better beat them. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to get beat the Buccaneers. We need to get revenge on the Panthers. Yeah. Um, even though they don't have Dante Foreman anymore, so he's with the Bears. Um, but yeah, I think the Lions, and maybe the Saints. Maybe there's some weird scenario. The Saints kind of do that thing every year where they're competitive at times. Yeah. Through their first six, I think they should be at least four and two. At least. Yeah. That's Chiefs, Seahawks, Falcons, Packers, Panthers, Buccaneers. Yes. Four and two. They should be able Five to and start. One. They should be able to should start be. strong. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, I, I think twelve and five is a good good number. Um and that's scary to say. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Um, but speaking of the Lions getting better, there's been, you know, some little rumors here and there, and they're just rumors. But I like to speculate. Um, DeAndre Hopkins has been kind of odd about his situation, which I don't blame him. The Cardinals are a mess. Uh, they don't know if Car- Kyler Murray is even going to start the season or not. And there's just a lot of question marks. So he's come out and kind of said he wants like a good quarterback that loves the game. He wants a better defense for his team. All very cryptic stuff while he's still saying he's sticking around. But then he comes out with like his top ten or top five quarterbacks he would like to play with before he ends his career or something. He named, of course, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Patrick Mahomes, all the top guys. Jared Goff not included. But would you take DeAndre Hopkins on the Lions? Would if, I? If he was, I mean, that's, that's if he very, was interested. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Some people think that he has a. I don't know, like a locker room Listen. that they think he's starting to become a, a locker room guy. I mean, it doesn't fit in the locker room. I've I never guess. heard anything. If it came out, if it was true, then it would have happened in Houston. Right. Because he didn't have a quarterback until Deshaun Watson. Mm. And he was elite top five receiver for the, for the entire time. Yeah. And he was never known as a locker room cancer then. Mm-hmm. If I was him, I'd be pissed about what was happening in Arizona. Like you don't like you don't know what you're getting out of your quarterback. Yeah, you don't know what the defense is going to do. You have a new head coach. You're not sure about him. Mm-hmm. You're still trying to build some type of relationship with him. So yeah, it's everything is up in the air in Arizona. So he he has reasons. Yeah, he has many reasons to feel the way he feels. Mm-hmm. So yeah, without a doubt, you take DeAndre Hopkins. I don't see how that's a even an argument. Okay. I, I've heard otherwise. Unless there's injury issues, I I just I don't. No, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's an aging wide receiver. I guess he's 31, I think. Um, but he's proved that he's still healthy when he plays, and he looks good. Uh, and especially with the Jameson Williams suspension, like to me, it's also no brainer. Like he says that he wants to play with like a, a quarterback that loves the game. I don't know J- golf personally, but he seems like he likes golf the game. is all in in Detroit. That means, and he seems, he, that, I think that means he loves the game. Yes. He's not top tier, but he's, he's in that second tier. He's on the edge say. of top 10. Yeah. He's like around 10 or 11. Yeah. And then we have a d- good defense now. It's, you know, we won't know until we're on the field, but realistically the defense on paper looks a lot better. Um, And I think the coaching staff, is a perfect fit to me. They seem like they're just guys that get along with players, players, coaches. And uh, again, Ben Johnson would have a riot with a guy like DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins, Jamison Williams, Amon Ross St. Brown, Jameer Gibbs, Sam Laporta. Okay, we're looking like one of the best offenses in the league all of a sudden. So, yeah, I I just heard some people say they wouldn't want him. To me, I don't get it, but. Plus, you want some veteran guys in the locker room, especially for a team that's getting ready to compete. DeAndre Hopkins hasn't really been able to compete except for, like, what, like a year or two in Houston? Yeah. Uh, And so this might be that kind of point. I don't think DeAndre Hopkins is coming to Detroit, but I like to think about it and would I do it. I Um, there's some realism there because I don't think it's happening either. Yeah. I don't see it happening. But we can hope. Um. In NBA news, before we get to the, the playoffs and stuff, we have a couple of uh, retirements, maybe retirements. Um, Carmelo Anthony 
decided to call it quits after 19 years. I don't know how to feel, <laughs> to be honest. Because Elaborate, please. <laughs> it, I am starting to get that, like, old man vibe. Where I just I'm and I'm I'm only thirty years old. Oh, okay. But it's like all of a sudden, well, yeah. LeBron's the last one left of the L three class. All these, He's the last one. All these guys are starting to retire that I grew up with, and even like, like I always say too, like I grew up watching some guys in the nineties. So those guys have well gone and passed. Now we're getting to like guys where I was like locked into basketball and constantly keeping up. And they're leaving the league. Yeah. And that just feels that feels weird. And like you said, that that draft class, LeBron being the only one left, is wild to think about. Now we knew Carmelo had like his last so many years have not been anything special, but he still like did okay from time to time. He would have a game or two. Um and it just it's just wild, I guess, to think about. When you put things in perspective, it just feels odd and Carmelo I know we did a top 10 list a long time ago but he's like one of my top I don't know I, I can't remember if I don't think I put him in my top five of all time but he's like right there he's like six or seven for me in my like top 10 of all time players that I just enjoy and enjoy watching so it, it hits even more a little bit for me that now literally I think my entire top 10 list is out Except for Steph Curry might be in there. It's hard to say. We'd have to maybe rehash a top 10 list, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's just a wild, wild feeling to me. Um, especially because, too, like, the weird part is, like, so many videos that came out on Twitter that were talking about the Carmelo retirement, they were posting Knicks videos. Now, I know he had a long tenure with the Knicks. He had, you know, the, the 60 points or whatever, the garden. He had a really Listen. good... Tenure in Denver as well. There, though. there's a generation of children, including me, that had a Denver Carmelo Anthony jersey, mm -hmm. and I also had the matching Jordans. Yeah, there, are, there are, might be millions of boys, the powder and girls blue. in this country mm -hmm. that had a Carmelo Anthony jersey at some point. Like that was one of the highest yeah. selling, like most popular jerseys out. Mm -hmm. The cornrow days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's just wild to me. Um, yeah, he, where does he land on like your lists or just memories or whatever? I mean, all time that that would be a tough one to think all time. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of like when the top seventy five, he didn't make the top seventy five list. Did he, did he make it? I have to. I can't even remember. Did. But to Carmelo Anthony is a top seventy five player of all time. He's one of the greatest scorers to ever play the game. He had everything in his bag. He had in. Amazing size. He was six. He was sixty third. Okay, he was six eight, like two thirty, two thirty five. He could bully you. He could take you out. He had handle. He had everything. Mm -hmm. He was one of the most amazing players to watch. Just score. Now he did have some flaws, like on the defensive effort. Uh, just being able to get a team over the hump, he never w really was able to do it fully. He got Denver to the Western Conference Finals. That's as far as he could go. Mm -hmm. And then Kobe and the Lakers took him out. Yeah. It was an accomplishment. He did it with Chauncey. But, yeah, with the Knicks, he was never able to get them past the second round. Arguably should have beat LeBron for Rookie of the Year. Made the playoffs as a rookie. So he had an argument. Yeah. But Melo, he, he's an icon for us. Mm -hmm. For our generation, he is definitely an icon. Everybody that grew up watching the last real – I'd say like the the last time there was a sweet spot where it was still like tough hard nosed basketball, but the talent level was starting to get to a, like a super high level. Mm -hmm. When all of them, LeBron, D Wade, Carmelo was coming in, Kobe was still playing, yeah. T Mac was still in his prime. That was the era where everything was like at the peak of basketball, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah, and Melo was one of the best players in that era. Yeah, he did struggle with the transition of how the game has formed into because he yes. was more of an iso scorer yeah there there um, was that two three year period where he had to yeah yeah but think about how many kids nowadays shoot threes and then just put three to their head like that's a that's yeah. a mellow thing in my and, mind yeah. speaking of the new he became a meme with the hoodie mellow stuff yeah <laughs> the off-season hoodie mellow yeah 
And we haven't even brought up the fact that he had one of the greatest one and done seasons in college basketball history. Mm -hmm. Stepped into Syracuse, was an instant top five player in college basketball, had one of the best tournament runs and won a championship one season at Syracuse. Mm -hmm. Stepped right into the NBA and became a high level player there too. Yep. So there was rarely a time where Carmelo wasn't one of the best players at his level. Yeah. He was always up there. Which I think just leads to he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Yes. Um, some people will say, oh, he didn't play great defense. He didn't win stuff. That goes for and a lot of greats. At the end of the day, though, he has a national championship in college. And yes. it's the, it is the basketball Hall of Fame that people exactly. always forget about. Yeah. Um, Listen, he has a better resume with both of those than some people that are in. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Chris Webber. Uh, he's a fat five guy. <laughs> Had some cool stats in the NBA. Didn't win much. Yeah. Carmelo has a better resume than some of those guys. Mm-hmm. Grant Hill, too. He yeah. has a better resume than Grant Hill, even though Grant won two at Duke, I think. Yeah, he did. So that's where he got it. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it's just uh, it's crazy to think about. But yeah. the guy that we alluded to, who is the only one left from that draft class, class just got swept by the Nuggets. Can you, can, can, let's just take a second. I want you to express how you felt. It when le- when, Le- when LeBron, he got tied up by Jamal Murray, got blocked at the rim, and then that clock hit zero. Oh, it was beautiful. And it was official. To get blocked, for LeBron to get blocked at the end of that game was beautiful. Yeah. And I texted our group chat at halftime, and I said, because LeBron was having a crazy game. He had, what, 31 in the 31, first half? 31, 4 and 4 in the first half. He, he walked away with five seconds left in the second quarter, yeah. took his jersey off, and he was clearly just spent. Mm-hmm. And I said, and I think the Nuggets were down like 16 or 17 at the time. And I just hoped, I was like, man, it would just be so beautiful if LeBron dropped 50 and the Nuggets came back and still won the game. <laughs> now, LeBron didn't drop He didn't 50. have enough in the tank to get to 50. No. Um, but he still had a good game, still finished the game pretty ge- good. But the Nuggets were able to come back. I think everybody pretty much knew that the Nuggets had another run in them after the first half. Yeah. It wasn't going to be a Lakers blowout. And it felt great. But the wild thing was at the end of that game, LeBron actually mentioned possibly hanging it up. Well, some, somebody asked the question. Yeah. And he responded saying. Like he has to think about yeah, it. Yeah, he has a lot to think about in the offseason. Yeah. And it is a possibility. Which, you know, a lot of guys say that. Aaron Rodgers have been saying that. LeBron is coming back. Yeah, I <laughs> wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. But it's wild to even put that into your mind that LeBron could be retiring. Now, when you think about it, he's 38, and it makes yeah. complete sense. But at the same he, time. He, just, he, just, he had to give everything he could to try and beat the Nuggets. Yeah. Five years ago, that would be an absolute shock saying that. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's, it's he can't carry a team anymore. Yeah. And he can't, like we saw, he can't do it in just one game even. Like he tried. And he just ran out of gas. Yeah. That's like the first time that I feel like I've seen LeBron seem human. Because he had a crazy first half, and you're like, oh, well, LeBron's just going to go off, and they're going to win this game. But then in the second half, he just kind of tailed off, and you're yeah. like. That third quarter, he was super passive. Yeah. He wasn't driving to the rim as much as he. And the Nuggets went on an 18-4 run, mm-hmm. and Bron was just coasting for the most part. Even towards the end of the game, he there was a couple times where I thought he could have just drove to the basket. And there was a time where he he kind of hesitated. He looked at the he was at the three point line. He hesitated, looked at the basket. I think Jamal Murray was on him. And he kind of like hesitated and then he threw it over to Schroeder and then Schroeder gave it to Reeves in the corner or something, missed the three. And I was like, What? What? I was just thrown off because he just did not do anything. Yeah, but there We also have to realize this is the reason why he brought in Anthony Davis. Well, that's a good point. Where was Anthony Davis? Where was he? Until the fourth quarter, he was pretty invisible. Yeah. And it was a disappointment for most of the game. Now, are you like Chris and going to blame the coach, or are you going to blame the players? Because that's a whole topic I would like to get into. Some of it is on him. The Lakers like to blame like 90% of it on him. Yeah. But Anthony Davis obviously has – he's one of the most inconsistent – Borderline superstar players in the league. Mm -hmm. He will give you 35 and almost 20 one night and look like almost the best big in the league. And then he'll give you like 19 and 10. And he'll go extended periods without 
either he's not aggressive or he is aggressive and just looks terrible on offense. Yeah. And there was a little bit of both in yesterday's game. Mm-hmm. <sighs> to me, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, when it comes to the Lakers, like Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura, it seems like those are going to become the focal points. Maybe. For the most part, They have maybe. to be able to yeah. retain Austin Reeves, and that's a big question mark in the offseason. I, I think they're going to they're gonna get him back. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Unless they go for Kyrie, which is a whole other thing. <laughs> that's like an offseason. Let's talk about the Nuggets. Okay. Let's talk about the team that actually deserves this. Mm-hmm. First time ever making the finals. Yeah. And we said it. We mentioned it last yeah. week, like, out of all, like, there's been good Nuggets teams throughout the years. Um, yeah, that Mellow Nuggets team, everybody thought had a legit chance. Yeah, this team a couple times looked like they were going to do it. Got injured late in the season. Things happened. Haven't made it. And then you have to go way back to, like, early 90s, late 80s, um, where the Nuggets were actually really good. Yeah, they upset the Sonics in, like, 93 yeah. as an eight seed. Yeah. Like, to this day, that's probably their biggest playoff series win, mm-hmm. which is nuts to yeah. think about. Right. Otherwise, people don't really know the Nuggets. Yeah, you listen, you we we know we know about Kenneth Reed, we know about the Manimal, Kenyon and Martin, Ty Lawson in those short periods. Ty Lawson of like young Evan Fournier and Danilo Gallinari. We we saw those moments where it was A like young J.R. Smith. Listen, the the Nuggets they they're interesting. Yeah, for like ten years, that's what we were saying. The Nuggets are interesting. A middle aged Andre Iguodala, yeah, but they, they can never get over the hump. Mm-hmm. And then they drafted. A guy out of Serbia during a Taco Bell commercial. In the second round. Named Nikola Jokic. They, yeah. Nobody knew who he was. Mm-hmm. And. He didn't even come yeah. over right away in his rookie year. Uh, it took a year yeah. to bring him and over. He played with Kenneth Reed. Yeah. He played with Gallinari. He played with those guys. And there was a controversy where Yusuf Nurkic. Yeah. Some Nuggets fans thought he was the keeper. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if they traded away Nikola Jokic <laughs> and kept Yusuf Nurkic? And we'd be talking about the Blazers. Listen, it it is a Milwaukee Bucks Giannis Antetokounmpo level. Mm-hmm. This is this is an even bigger level of can you believe we hit? Yeah, on that he averaged a double a triple double in the Western Listen, Conference. You Finals. you have a all time great, no doubt top five center by the time he's done, mm-hmm. and you drafted him in the second round. Yeah, as long as he stays healthy and things, he's. Straight to the top. This, this is the first year that entire team has been healthy for like three, four years. Yeah. And they're all, every piece fits. It seems like they all love playing together. Whenever Jokic is out of the game, Jamal Murray picks up the slack. He's healthy. Whenever Murray is out of the game, Nikola Jokic comes back in. Mm-hmm. And he does his job. Aaron Gordon had a huge game four. He hit three threes and did all the dirty work. Michael Porter Jr., KCP. Everybody does what they're, everybody yeah. plays to their strengths. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Mike just, Malone is still a high-level coach. They just feel like a really well-balanced team. Yeah. And, you know, as being an 4 Pistons fanatic, that's what I like to see when teams play and they're well-balanced. But, man, they got to stop giving Jokic the ball with two seconds left at the three-point oh, they, line. They have a lot of possessions where you now, know, it ends up in his hands and he's away from the paint and he, he just has to Now, he's up. made it a lot <laughs> on those Let's, scenarios. That, but. That, that step away three. In it's the fourth, wild. I, I love when he hits shot like shots like that. Yeah, but it, um, it happens too often. Yeah, yes. I understand. Um, but yeah, they're they're fun to watch. Aaron Gordon is playing great. He's finally stayed healthy. Michael Porter Jr., who people thought was just done. Listen, he was a top three pick coming out of his class. Yeah, and then he had injury issues. Mm-hmm. And then they get him at the thirteenth pick. And then he had like that time where like he came back and he was healthy and he was good for a while, and then he got hurt again, and yeah. people were like, "Oh, his career is over." And he's kind of climbed back into being somebody relevant. So it's crazy. Again, like I said before, I think I said it last week, they have former Pistons in KCP and Bruce Brown who are also playing really well for the team. I love how you just, just exclude one person. Well, you know, he doesn't He doesn't play anyway. <laughs> yes, also, they have. Sure, they have Reggie, Reggie Jackson. Jackson. <laughs> but he doesn't play. Joey's favorite Piston. The Nuggets are smart enough not to play Mr. him. Mr. Hero Ball himself. God, don't get me started. <laughs> But yes, Bruce Brown and KCP. If we had a man, maybe we have to make a top ten most hated players list. That, That's a good listen. One. That that is very controversial, and yes, we should do it during the <laughs> summer. I guess we, we have to have Chris it. on for that episode, though. Oh, I agree. I don't think Reggie makes my number one, but he might be close. He's, he's probably top three from how much you. He's close. Yeah, 
Every time he comes up, you just look disgusted. I'd have to analyze it. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Nuggets in the NBA Finals. It's going to be exciting, I think. Yeah, Nikola Jokic got the Bill Russell Award. Mm-hmm. Was it the is it the Bill Russell Award? I uh, can't even remember. That, well, it would make sense. That's if Finals Bill Rus- MVP. Bill Russell would be on the. I can't remember. He got Finals. East, he got Conference assume. Finals MVP. That's when Nikola Jokic got. Yeah, now that they started splitting them. What is that called? Yeah, the Bill Russell Award is the Finals MVP. Western Conference Finals MVP. I want to see what the name of it is. Uh, Of course, they don't even say it. Western Conference Finals MVP. They're not even calling it by the actual name from what I can see. Anyway, on to the Eastern Conference where it's been much of the same. The uh, Miami Heat and the Celtics. Miami Heat are kind of taking care of business. They looked like they were going to sweep the Celtics, but Celtics got one last night, kind of snuck one out, finally played well. But it's 3-1. Nobody's ever, you know, come back from 3-0. So I don't expect the Celtics to make some miracle. I don't either. I honestly expect Miami to probably close this out in game six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Or five. Yeah. Yeah. This is the one that's interesting to me because this is where in our group chat, Chris has been going crazy about coaches lately. It, he's talked about Mike Budenholzer needing to be fired. He got fired. He wanted, now he's calling out Joe Missoula saying he doesn't do anything. He can't make adjustments, which is partially true. It's a it's a situation thing with Missoula, but yeah. But Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have put up goose eggs Outside time of and this time last again. game. Yes. Besides yeah. the last game. Those first three games, like, there's so many games where I just tuned in all of a sudden and Tatum's like one for seven and two for eight. I- Actually, the crazy part about the first two games, Jason Tatum finished with like 30, mm-hmm. 30 plus the first two games. But in the fourth quarters, he didn't score. Yeah. So the first three quarters, he was playing well in the first two games. Fourth quarter was non existent. Right. Jalen Brown. He mm-hmm. has been terrible. Yeah. And that's an understatement. He's been bad. Mm-hmm. Like, b- almost can't dribble bad. <laughs> it's been strange. Yeah. And and that's the kind of thing that I don't like when, when people are like, oh, coaches, you know, this coach stinks, this coach needs to do that. There's a certain point where in the NBA, the players just have to do it. Like, the players have to play. They're the ones that get paid the most. Yes, the the coach is kind of there to advise and keep everybody's mental in check, I guess, I would say. But I don't I'm not one to believe that NBA coaches are doing a crazy amount in game, I guess. In my opinion. Am I we wrong? Dis- we disagreed on this one. Yeah, we did. We disagreed a lot on this one. I think coaching I think it clearly shows teams that don't have good enough coaching and teams that do. Like Eric Spolstra is one of the best coaches of our generation. Mm-hmm. And it's clear the difference between him and Joe Missoula in the series. Yeah, and I'm not saying that there's not good coaches and bad coaches, but you can't always go to the next coach in line. Like eventually you have to say either sure, sure maybe it's not the like exactly the players, but you have to go to like the GM, like, who built this team. Like, this team is not working out. You can't just keep switching coaches and try to fix the problem. I mean, yeah, coaches deserve time. Yeah. I understand that part. And then there's coaches, like, to me, and maybe this is getting off tangent a little bit, but people praise Ty Lu for being a good coach. I don't see anything that Ty Lu has done to, like, deserve being a good coach. I think what he did last season was really impressive. No Kawhi, no Paul George. Robert Covington and relying on, like, he was relying on role players for the most part and yeah. still got the Clippers to the playoffs. And then I think the reason and that that's And that's a very good coaching job. I think the reason that he lost this year was because he didn't use those same role players that helped him last year. Well, when, when Paul George and Kawhi come back, you you got to play a certain way. Well, Paul, Paul George didn't finish out the series. and He didn't, I, yeah. To me, it's just, I don't know. I, I start to get flustered when people start bringing up coaches. And So what, what if you could... Give, like, one main point of your thought on coaching. What would it be? Oh, 
because it's it seems like it's like in in several different places. What where where does it all come together for one point about coaches? To me, I think it's in it's when we're in game, like when we are in the game. I think there's only so much that a coach can do. Out like in practices and getting prepared and getting the players right before the game. Yes, I think they can do a lot. I think they, a coach can do a lot for a development of a player over time. Um, we've seen it with guys like Greg Popovich, you know. But at the same time, like, there's a certain point in the game that, like, Joe Missoula changing something up, like, what is that going to do? Like, I guess it'd have to be a specific example. Like, I mean, I, I would agree there are times where game three, it, it – clearly appeared that Boston was mentally out of it halfway through the game. Mm-hmm. And no matter and what there, he there was says, nothing Joe, Yeah, there was nothing Joe Mazzulla could have done at that point. Right. I understand that example. Part of that is Joe Mazzulla not being very experienced. Yeah. But there are moments in playoff series where teams get blown out, and it's obvious after a few quarters. That, But, yeah, that's, that's, just, that's one example, though. Yeah. I, just, I, I think in most instances, a good coach can – does salvage teams. Mm-hmm. The best coaches do get their teams back into a series. Yeah. Now there are also there are examples like Mike Budenholzer where it seems like his voice has kind of. There are times where a coach needs to go because their voice has fallen on deaf ears. Yeah. They've been there too long. He won a championship, but Eric Spolster and the Heat just completely dismantled them. Yeah. And if you're a championship team that's favored. To be at the top, that shouldn't happen. So yeah. I can understand Mike Budenholzer being gone. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's 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 kind of now that I think about it, it's different for every coach. Mm-hmm. Like Doc Rivers, we blame Doc Rivers for a lot of it, don't we? Yeah, because <laughs> he has so many chokes at this point, right? And the same result has happened over and over again. Yeah, and it's that clear makes, Doc Rivers need to be fired. Yeah, and that makes sense. You gotta you gotta move on eventually. I, I understand that point. But yes, too. a coach. I, I can agree that a coach, yes, a coach can only do so much when it comes to certain points. Mm-hmm. Then it goes to the players being mentally ready and mentally strong and just, yeah, being prepared to win. Like, just even thinking of, like, little things. Like, I'm just looking at little game logs, and I'm noticing consistently the Heat are shooting very well from three, and it's typically the same kind of guys. It's Gabe Vincent, Max Struess, Duncan Robinson, and actually in this series, Caleb Martin. Yeah, he's been shooting the lights out. I'm tr- I cannot imagine Joe Missoula saying, "Hey, just let them keep shooting. Don't worry about it." He's got to be saying, "Get out on shooters." And at that point, players have to do it. And even if Joe Missoula doesn't say it, players got to be smart enough to know, "Hey, these guys are hitting a lot of threes on us. Maybe we should uh get out there." A little and this bit. is where I agree some. <laughs> you can't just say get out on shooters and the players the players know, know to what they are supposed to do out there for the most part. Mm. But when the Heat starts switching things up and Eric Spolster comes at them with different looks, Joe Mazzula has to be able to switch up a defense and switch guys and tell guys where to be at certain points. Like Miami is always locked in on defense. Until last game in that second half where Boston just lit up on fire Mm -hmm. and couldn't miss from three, Boston was in every gap. They got so many steals and so many turnovers, just tapping passes from the corner. Miami was always in the right place. Yeah. You could tell Eric Spolstra was pretty much reading what Boston was going to do. That's where Joe Mazzulla has to make changes. But but them st- And he also doesn't use timeouts. But them a lot, stealing is, passes yeah. is not really an Eric Spolstra thing. Now we don't know that uh, now to be fair, we don't know the inner workings of, you know, every little thing. But to me like the players, sure, maybe Eric Spolstra is putting them in positions to succeed to an extent. But like the players also have to understand that and read that and get what he's saying, I guess, if that makes sense. The players have to make plays. Exactly. I know know that, yeah. The players have to make happen what the coach says. So to me, it's just like, again, like the coach just can only do so much. I don't know. It's just my my little gripe. Like Missoula. I can understand certain certain parts of what you're saying and other parts, yeah, we disagree. Like Missoula has hardly been there. So – he only has so much information in coaching. That's what it, that goes on to Brad Stevens, right? Him hiring Joe Mazzulla, that that goes all the way to Brad and the GM. Mm-hmm. Like, to, he should have known that Joe Mazzulla 
was just, well, he was a, he's a young guy with potential. Yeah, that doesn't mean he's ready to coach a championship team. Right, and that Joe Mazzulla should have. Kn- I mean, Brad Stevens should have known that. And that's my other thing is like, he just started coaching this team. He got them to another conference finals. Yes, they didn't get to where they got last year, but it's also like he just got thrust into the role. He clearly had potential. Brad Stevens saw what he could be. Right. But, so, yeah. And they also lost assistance from last year, like Will Hardy, who's the coach at Utah this year. Had a really good first year at Utah. Damon Stoudemire left. He's the coach at Georgia Tech now. So, yeah, Joe Mazzulla, even though the team was built to win, it wasn't easy around him from a coaching standpoint mm-hmm. and his inexperience. Yeah. To me, I don't know. It's just a whole – it's a whole topic, yeah. and it's it. Unfortunately, it's one of those topics that you because you don't know specifically, it can go round and round in circles like we're kind of doing. Um, but when it gets to such high level basketball, in my opinion, with NBA guys, the great ones are always going to step up, and that's kind of like we've seen Jimmy Butler do it multiple, multiple times. Jason Tatum. He does every time it's in the balance. He's he pulls been here it out. and there. Every time a series is is in the balance, that's when he does it. Like he's, Jimmy Butler does it like from the jump. Yeah, and even Jalen Brown, kind of the same way. Like there's yeah. games where he starts off hot. Yeah. Jason Tatum can't do anything, and then it seems like Tatum finishes the game. So they kind of have that ebb and flow with them a little bit more. So to me, they're starting to be on the cusp of. Are they? superstars or are they all stars and that's where i'm curious i'd say tatum is a superstar Mm -hmm. in the same way tracy mcgrady and vince carter were superstars okay tracy mcgrady never got over the hump yeah he was elite Mm -hmm. as good as kobe for a a season or two vince carter was air canada he was almost the michael jordan of toronto Mm -hmm. got them to an eastern conference final and he was possibly better with the nets as much as yeah. I hate to even admit it. And the Nets the Nets never made the conference finals when he was there. Mm-hmm. He made it to one conference final in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, because the, uh, the Nets made it to the conference finals the that year was, before he it arrived. It was 02 and 03. Yeah, so it was like the yeah. year before he came. So would you question that they're superstars, Team Mac and Vince? They're definitely superstars, right? As... You know it's wild for unless me. you Unless you start doing rethinking. Well, for me... <laughs> to, me it's, to me, it's no question. For me, I think... Tracy McGrady probably is. Carmelo was a superstar. And the wild thing for me is that, you know, Vince Carter might be my favorite, is my favorite player of all time. He's my second favorite of all time. I'm not sure if I put him in the superstar category. Interesting. You think he's in that weird in between all star superstar? Yeah, he's on that cusp. I don't know, man. Vin, I know. I, was, I know. I know. Vince it, was. It's hard for me to even yeah. say that. Uh, but there are some players that are in a weird gray area, but mm-hmm. I, I, I think Vince was, he was, he was, yeah, he was, yeah, he was it, on the face of video games. And he to had be honest, the, he had shoes. He was the face of Canada basketball. And to be honest, a lot of the times he was probably underrated from, for most people, probably most people just saw him as the guy that dunks where he had a much more complete game. Yeah. But I don't know. He was, I, I'd put Jason Tatum in. Yeah. So in between that Tracy McGrady, Vince Carter area. Mm hmm. So I, I think he's there. But some superstars disappoint. Yeah. That's a part of it to me. Mm-hmm. Tracy McGrady and Vince Carter dis- disappointed. Carmelo That's Anthony fair. is a Knicks icon, kind of, mm-hmm. but can never get past the second round. Yeah. yeah some superstars can never just get past that certain level. Mm-hmm. It it starts to become, are you going to be, like, not necessarily LeBron, but the LeBron type or the Russell Westbrook type, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and that's kind of what we're finding out about Jokic too on the other side, which is is yeah. pretty cool. Because a lot of people have been waiting to see this from Jokic because mm-hmm. the numbers reflect, and when you watch him, it reflects an all time great. Yeah. But when you an all time great has to get over the hump, mm-hmm. and he's finally doing it. Yeah. Um. So you predict you you think it's just going to be five? You think the Heat just win the next game? Because Jimmy is my favorite player. Jimmy's my guy. I hold him to a high standard in these playoffs because he expects us to. I was disappointed in, in him last game. Now, every everybody has a down game. I don't expect Jimmy to be a god every single game in the playoffs. Nobody's perfect mm-hmm. in these situations. But outside of game two, where he scored 35 and hit those big shots to get them that second road win, 
to go yeah. up two zero. I think he's just been solid in this series. Game four, the the supporting cast played huge. Mm-hmm. Gabe Vincent had twenty nine, his career high. This last game, a lot of the shots that he hits normally, he was out of rhythm. It seemed mm-hmm. he was out of rhythm. He turned the ball over sometimes, and it got away from Miami. I expect Jimmy to have a bounce back in this one. I expect at least 27, 28, Mm -hmm. probably 30. And it could be a close game. There's, there's a, there's a scenario where Boston wins it and they start gaining some momentum. I'm not saying they're going to pull off this legendary comeback, but this is the best chance Miami has to get it done. Mm -hmm. I think Spolstra and Jimmy have enough left in the tank to finish it out in Boston. Yeah. Because Boston hasn't proven at home in this series that they can just get it done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when when things start to get kind of messy, they they start to get tight. Yeah. So yeah, I'll I'll go Miami, and in, I, in a close game. I do agree with maybe you. a low scoring game, like something like one hundred one to like ninety eight. Yeah, I think if if Eric Spolster is able to pull this off, he goes right. up even higher He's, in the coach rankings. Listen, Glenn Rivers. Not even Doc. Glenn Rivers, mm-hmm. he was ranked as like one of the 50 greatest coaches. Yeah. I need him and Spolstra to switch spots mm-hmm. if Spolstra gets them to the finals. Right. I mean, he's been a part of their all their recent championships. Yeah. He was assistant on the 06 team, and then he won with LeBron, which, eh. That's, that's what everybody said at that time. Right. But as soon as LeBron left and they kept winning, mm-hmm. that's when he started that's when it started to show. Yeah. They kept making the playoffs. So it's pretty wild. Um have any predictions on Denver and the Heat if that's what happens? Well, we'll have so much analysis on it when it comes, but cuz those I, will start most I think of, the like, I think first June 1st is when it starts, I yeah. think. Yeah. I would early guess, I would say, like, Denver and six. Mm. I think Denver is so locked in together. And the fact that they are fully healthy. Yeah. Like, the Heat getting to the finals in this situation as an eight seed Mm -hmm. is an all-time accomplishment. Yeah. Denver is the best team out right now. Mm -hmm. And I think you need a fully healthy team, including Tyler Hero, including Victor Victor Oladipo. Jimmy Butler would have to pull off some crazy stuff Mm -hmm. for them to win that series. Like, their defense would have to be incredible. It would almost have to lead to, like, Yoga to Jamal Murray getting injured for them to win that series. Yeah. And nobody wants to see that. Right. Yeah, fully healthy Denver, locked in still. I don't think they – Yeah. Yeah. I think the matchups are also bad for the Heat. They got nobody that can stop Jokic. Sure, Bam can keep up to a certain degree. But, yeah. I mean, Jokic has been tearing up everybody. So, how much can he really do? Jimmy Butler doesn't, like – He's not guarding anybody of importance in this series. Unless- Den- Denver probably puts Aaron Gordon on Jimmy Butler, which right. is a problem. Mm-hmm. And then Jimmy That's Butler, a, maybe you could put on like. You put him on Jamal Murray, I yeah, assume. Yeah, like, but, but that yeah. makes things weird too. So, uh, yeah, it, it just turns into a, a tough spot. Are you, are you throwing Kyle Lowry and his antics at Jamal Murray? Is that what you're doing No, I'm when just, Jimmy's out the game? I'm just, I'm just saying out loud. Yeah. When Jimmy's out the game, who are you putting on Jamal? Right. Like, Gabe Vincent can't guard him when he's going. Yeah. So, that, that's where I just feel like the matchups are they're tough. Because um, then you're if, if Jimmy Butler goes to somebody else, you're leaving guys like KCP and Michael Porter Jr. Yeah. to you leave Duncan them open. Robinson or something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's a wash. Yeah. I, so, early guess, I would say Denver in six. Yeah. I almost want to push Denver in five, but I would hope for a better series than that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm excited either way. Um, I don't want the Celtics to make a comeback. I want this to go sooner so we can get to the NBA playoffs. Because like I said, I don't really care about Heat and Celtics. So just get to the NBA Finals for me, yeah. and then let's <laughs> let's get the off season. Let's get this stupid draft over with. Let's <laughs> have another terrible Listen, Cam, season. Listen, Cam Whitmore has a lot of potential. Oh. He can be really. Don't you listen. We got a lot of talk about for the off season. Yeah. Because the the Pistons are going to have to make a move. And there's not that many great names out there. Yeah. Also, everybody saying you're not going to watch the finals if it's Denver Miami, good. Who's, are people saying that? There are tons of 
there, there, there's a huge narrative now that's pretty much right. At least 80% of basketball opinions on Twitter, people that give basketball opinions, they don't love basketball. They love basketball narratives and they love like specific players Lakers and Celtics. their success. Yeah. They don't really love basketball. Mm-hmm. Denver, Miami will be high level basketball. Yeah. Like I don't know if you're not, if you're not excited for that as a basketball fan, mm-hmm. what are you? Right. You don't care. A Lakers like, fan. I saw somebody that was a Phoenix fan on Twitter saying all caps, if my team doesn't play, I don't watch period. Yeah. I get go that. go get, I, get I, out of here. I get it to a certain. We don't degree, want you, but at the same time, like we don't want you. <laughs> go somewhere else. Basketball purists unite. Oh boy! Well, that was a fun episode. Um, next week, right? It'll be after Memorial Day. We'll be into June, and uh, just a little bit of playoff talk, and then we'll figure out fun, something fun to talk about. Yeah. Uh, maybe we will sprinkle in the Tigers. Um, I'll have to do some research because I only know a little bit that's going on this season. They 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 got a few guys on some hot streaks. Yeah, Riley Green, Spencer Torkelson, Erod even, pitching even well. Javi Baez isn't yeah. awful right now. Yeah, yeah, some positives. Mm-hmm. And then we'll start uh, whipping up some top ten lists um, for those fun days. But uh, this has been views from the sidelines, and we will see you guys next time. LeBron retires to the happiest day of your basketball life. No, probably not. It just makes me feel older. It's just the Lakers part? Yeah, mostly.